Well, go for it. Welcome back to the, yeah. the running running Marvel commentary for every Marvel TV show. <laughs> yeah, this is our new tradition. I don't see that as a bad habit. Oh no, and my I... kids are just thankful I have another person to have these conversations with. <laughs> it's not just them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not that we can't go off on our own little things, but it's like, oh look, she's gonna go talk to Dwight. Yay, we get a breather for a day or two. But of course, there's the amp up. You You're know, like, yeah, exactly. That, so. <laughs> it's after this conversation. Hey, you know what I thought while well, I was having that conversation. So I know, and we're going to have to, you know, gonna have to make do till, is it June when Loki it's comes out? June. Something like that. And, yeah. And we've just <laughs> entered lockdown again. Our, the Manitoba keeps doing these instead of good solid circuit breakers, we keep doing these first things and it's going to last a month. So I'm like, I am yeah. stuck in my house. <laughs> And I got no new Marvel fix. Got to call, <laughs> call, uh, yeah, dude, I got to call Disney Plus and say, hey, guys, come on, let's get it up here for Canada a little sooner. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm re-watching things <laughs> the day that the notification came out, which was Monday. Yeah, My yeah. mental health solution was to sit down in the evening and watch Infinity War and Endgame. Oh, wow. Which my kids were like, and that's your mental health solution. <laughs> that is, and that is a, that is a traumatic uh, watch in some ways. I'm going to move the. I just realized I had it on the weird camera where I was really small. I'm back now. Yeah. Um, no, no it, my, my son was, was like, mom, that's a little dark. You need a therapist. And I said, I, you know, I'm already seeing a therapist. They need to work harder. Oh, they, need <laughs> they need to work faster. To work harder. <laughs> <laughs> but what I loved about it was the resolution and the fact that those things that were again, were traumatic in the theater, the first time you were watching, right, it was right. like, this is all going to be fine. This is all good. Like, you know, this is going, I know where this is going. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember people don't and people joke about it now. Like, Oh, you knew they were coming back. And it's like, I kind of knew they were coming back, but not for sure. Well, <laughs> and not everybody did. And I think that was the no, part that's that's the thing, thing too, was watching the, to, to go then and go, okay, so now we've just watched oh. um, like Watson and Falcon and winter soldier. And you're like, think about where those are. Like we saw those movies a couple of years back. And yet yeah. these are things that are happening. Like WandaVision is like literally starting within the week or so after the blip. And then yeah. Falcon and Winter Soldier is, a, it's a little further out, but it's still not the length of time well, it that it's gets, been since we've seen those movies. <laughs> it gets, no, it's really interesting. One of the things that I really liked, I ended up liking uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, I thought was going to be just kind of this action romp or something, just kind of like, mm. and then you get into it. And that's one of the first things they run into is, some of the real world like economic realities and some of the just uh, problems that have cropped up because of the the blip, right? Because mm -hmm. of everybody being half the population being gone and then coming back. Um, and it's interesting to see as, as uh, I know we talked about the WandaVision thing, you know, we're not always used to seeing like real world consequences real world or emotional consequences coming from these kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. in, in comics. Yeah. And that was the part that was interesting or too in with shows. watching WandaVision was it was the localized post blip experience and what it meant for sort of one woman and how she processed all of these events. And again, as a culmination of things, whereas what Falcon and Winter Soldier gave us was this global perspective mm -hmm. on what had happened and how did a world come to turn with losing half its people, spending all of this time trying to readjust to that. And then all of a sudden they had to readjust again and, yeah. and the social consequences. And I thought it really been a lot of the stuff that we'd seen. Uh, it was a, an interesting encapsulation of the past few years in terms of what we saw in terms of refugees, whether that was folks coming up through um, the southern borders of, of the U.S. and how those folks were dealt with, uh, what was happening uh, refugees coming up through the Mediterranean and into Europe. And it was really interesting how a lot of dialogue that was there was, yeah. again, it's different. It's, it's happening in this parallel, you know, universe and yeah. GRC, but it was all the same language. And that's where, you know, spoiler alert, that last speech that, that Sam gave his Captain America was just like, dude is just get like the past five years of like world <laughs> geopolitics and just like, we can do better. Yes. Do better. <laughs> and that's one of the things, one of the things, and of course this will be spoiler laden. We're not going to, you know, yeah, if, you, yeah. if, if you're waiting and you're like, I haven't watched Falcon the Winter Soldier, I better hear this analysis of it first. That's fine. But you know, don't, don't blame us for spoiling it. Yeah. Um, 
when when he does, and we'll talk about the different the different iterations and the different things with Captain America that they did, which was really interesting. But mm -hmm. you find that um, not only does it address some of the economic realities, geopolitical realities, you actually have at the end a hero who's like, okay, there's a defeat of this terrorist group, but at the end he's like, stop calling them terrorists, and he does this kind of thing where he's being a superhero for the on the kind of geopolitical level where he's chewing out yeah. the uh, I don't I don't know if it was the United Nations or it was the United Nations a stand, that, a stand -in. See that fictional right. again paralleling yeah. a UN you know right. we're going to give a it some different in. initials we're yes. gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah a stand in for the UN and and essentially chewing them out and in this case because and it's one of those things where just like you can pick up and throw a car if you're the right person in the Marvel universe you can tell off the 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 faux UN and have them actually listen because you know that the joke in my house was you know as soon as that speech was given the next phone call is all right go ahead and uh, send the refugees back but in the reality of the mcu it makes an impact right mm -hmm. and people are like well you know kind of what are we going to do captain america you know just <laughs> got up and told us off and uh, so so being a hero at that level not just showcasing the problems but showcasing how somebody in captain america's shoes that sam fills in the end can actually push back and help people on a grander scale than just tackling a mugger right yeah exactly and the yeah. idea that he says you know like the only you know he rattles off that he doesn't have the super serum he's just you know the only the only power that he has is the belief that we can hurt. and i think yeah. that's been what's been uh, that's the culmination too of that journey that he and, and Bucky have been on together as mm -hmm. well is just this idea how each of them do better, how they challenge, how there's ups and downs. And I think the other part that I loved, especially considering it was a more abbreviated series. And so you're wondering, okay, how are they going to compact everything in? And are we going to be getting like rock em action all the time was the amount of things that were not action <laughs> that were actually, yeah, like, you know, family dinners and, and other kinds of, the two of them fixing the boat, like just, yes. the, and that line, we're just two guys as they sit there and negotiated in the backyard. Well, we're this, well, we're that, we'll partner. No, we're not partners. We're called legal. We don't want to say oh, friends. We're yeah, two yeah, guys, the friends. Yeah, friends. But the friends gone. So we're just two guys. We're two guys. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I thought really stood out for me was the uh, depiction of masculinity and what that could be versus what it should be versus you had all these different little pieces in there that show, you know, that showcase like the relationship with Bucky and Sam, where even when they're fighting there, I mean, there's a little bit of that machismo kind of bro stuff that, that is in there. I think that, you know, is in those male relationships, but the, even when they weren't getting along, they were very expressive, right? Yeah. They're expressive of how they're feeling. And then in that scene, that was, I think, a wonderful scene to showcase a different uh, look at masculinity to when when you got Sam stepping back into his social worker roots, which, by the way, we can forget that Sam originally when we meet him right in, in Winter Soldier is, is a social worker, essentially. Yeah. And yeah. He uh, you know, he's coaching Bucky on, you know, here's some tough love. You got to you got to do your therapy work, man. You got to mm -hmm. really heal. You got to be, you know, be who you are. And I thought that was a remarkable that that was in I think it was episode. I think that was actually the five. fifth one. I think it was. Yeah, the, the yeah that was the fifth ultimate. one because that was that really wacky one that had so much stuff related to um, John Walker and then going down this path of the yeah, yeah. like all the stuff at the backyard and whatever. And you're just like ah, oh. <laughs> all the feels. Well, that one I thought was really interesting too because it did bring it back to that thing where he had been doing that social work peer support thing i mean that's how we met him right yeah he's that guy with on your left on your left on your yeah. left and, you know come <laughs> PA, da, 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 da. and then what's interesting and, and i had forgotten about this it was in endgame one um steve pick up that mantle with yeah. folks and sitting there in that room where there's only like five or six folks and they're talking about what it's like oh and how you that's a on. good point yeah. yeah so you have that and then you watch him do that. And then the other part was that he was sitting there in the midst of all of this stuff with dealing with the fallout of, you know, how, how John is, has, Walker has sullied the shield. Um, it's back in his possession. What do he do? Um, and here, and then, you know, Bucky's struggling with all of this stuff and basically says, this is 
closest thing I've had to a family. And, and again, that's on one level, completely raw and honest. And at the same time, you're like, if dude feels the closest thing he has family is this because of what it represents whoa he's been down a hole and -hmm. what was interesting was listening to sam sit there and say well you got to you know doesn't matter what steve thinks or thought that doesn't matter you again the tough love you got to do the work and you got to thinking about what other people think and what they think you should be and you know all and so you and you just it's one of those Okay, so he's helping Bucky. And at the same time, this is him processing. Like, this is how you often hear about we teach people or we show people or we support people with the things that we actually know. So we're talking as much to ourselves as to someone else. And you're just like, and there is Sam and doing the work. He is damaging a lot of trees. And I was still waiting for the scene where that shield went through the, like, you know, a window and then right. Sarah coming out and ripping him a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's playing really you know, fast and loose when they're playing. You know, one of the things that stood out to me is during that exchange, you know, you look at that, he's mentoring for, yeah. uh, Bucky, and it's like, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're basically playing catch, right? Yeah. And there's like this, this tr- sort of traditional father-son moment, right? And he's sort of mentoring him. They're they're connecting as, as guys, and at the same time, they're playing catch with, of course, you know, a vibranium, you know, danger. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, still, exactly. you know, still, you know, they're superheroes, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> they're, they're superheroes. What kind of catch are they going to play? But yeah, uh, yeah. but that, that was yeah, very remarkable to him, as you put it, getting in touch with himself and at the same time, encouraging Bucky to, to do the same. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, about Bucky and his sort of 12 step ish journey, right, where he we see him making amends um, and trying to do something with this. And I thought it was remarkable to showcase this idea that, oh, I, you know, I spent all these years as a super assassin and the fact that of course that takes a toll on a person. Yeah. And I think in these roles, especially when it comes to the super guy, the super tough, you know, we, we get a little bit of a, oh yeah, oh, that kind of bothers me here and there, but it was like, you could tell that they had show this as a pervasive chronic PTSD anxiety mm-hmm. that was bleeding into his whole life, right? Which is a lot more realistic if you've been brainwashed to murder people for the whole Cold War or whatever. Well, and what I thought was interesting with that was the fact that they started off, you know, they, they purposely show him in therapy with you know, the condition of your response. So in other words, you're being given this clean slate that so many people, you know, depending on what it is that they, you know, people often say, if I just got a clean slate, if I just got this, that, and that, well, he gets those things. And what I thought was really interesting was watching, and he was just doing that thing where, you know, he was a butt on there. I am showing up. This is court mandated. Yeah, I'm here. You know, the nightmares going, no, but any nightmares. Yeah, I know how you're lying. Oh, the, then when she pull out the book, oh, the notebook again. Well, that's passive aggressive. And, you know, that whole flipping back, like I've, I've been doing this long enough that I know how to yeah. the language back on you so that I can now accuse my therapist of being passive aggressive yeah. when she calls on my stuff and so it was just really interesting watching him go through the motions and and that whole idea of okay well you know and the you know what are the three rules the three rules how he needed to keep being reminded about the second rule about nobody gets hurt um and but what was interesting was watching him kind of it wasn't really until he got to that place even though he had to do like the stuff with sam which i thought was really hilarious when they did the couple style counseling and again the two of them (laughs) where it was just like are you two having a staring contest? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yes, and mm, you know, and it's like, and then how Sam Lee, like, thanks, thanks, Doc, thanks for making it weird, you know. <laughs> but just that whole thing, where so much of it for him going through the motions, and that in a sense, just it didn't matter that she was somebody that had also served. Didn't matter. I think one thing that a lot of folks forget is that when you've had issues with trauma and especially if your trauma has been inflicted by someone who's in a position of a with you we have raging balls of issues around uh, around authority figures <laughs> and so he was just another authority figure to him and all of these things were like this is somebody else that i am suspicious that they are still either playing me or this really work and and whereas sam was someone as much as he fought it because it was always you know, it always seemed like it's this competition who likes Steve best or who, who did Steve like best. And when they got sort of over that and through that and, and whatever, it was 
when Sam was able to say to him, you know, again, that, that tough love part. And it's like, just making you're not making amends you're just doing this to make yourself feel good go out and help those people like actually truly make amends don't just say i'm sorry and check it off the list and that's the part that i sort of think about again is how often i mean you start with kids but it's the whole what does sorry mean right you you punched your brother go say sorry yeah fine sorry no 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 (laughs) like you mean it right. like you're not gonna go do it again in three minutes <laughs> and you and you look at what one of the most effective things that we don't often do with kids is we do the brush off sorry and make them do it instead of saying like look you know look at his face look at you know you hit him he's crying you're bigger than he is and let's let's yeah. sit and talk about that for a minute have him tell you how he feels and mm-hmm. you know and it leads up to and probably wise that it was off screen because i don't know how you know, some of these things, yeah. I don't know how you would have him confess and explain what the hell he was talking about to this guy. I mean, it's like, yeah, I killed your son and I was brainwashed and hypnotized. You know, we don't need to see that because that could take away from the emotional impact that you can see of here's this person who, and by making amends, he's essentially sort of severing the tie that he has. I assume the guy's not going to want to hang out with him after this. I don't mm-hmm. know, but you know, we see that at the end where he walks past the restaurant, he sees him moving on with his life, essentially shorthand, you know, for moving on with his life. And he, then he moves on, walks down the street. Right. Yeah. Um, Well, and I thought that was really important too, because I'd seen some comments online and, you know, again, there's these, all these different, everybody's writing something so that they can get the clicks kind of thing. And it was the whole, (laughs) Oh, it didn't do it justice. And I was like, Oh, This is like, they've been pretty raw with a lot of stuff in these two series. But one of those things in terms of making the amends is it's that's, there's there's certain stuff that's not for public consumption Mm -hmm. in terms of what that would mean for an individual. And then also it's into the complexity of a therapeutic relationship and all of these dynamics and what they were going through. And so that's just one of those things where, again, I honestly think that the way that they did it. Yeah. was sufficient we know that there was a conversation and that you know he was able to leave and you know it wasn't with somebody uh you know with their hands around the other person's throat or something that they're at a place of equanimity a place of it, it doesn't right or perfect but at least yori's got the answers about his son mm-hmm. and and that's again he, he's truly actually done the work. And it was the same thing with the notebook where leaving her the notebook, it's the fine, I've done the work. And, and, and in a way to, that was that sort of him leaving, again, th- thinking about the idea that he's had problems with already. <laughs> and, and this was the homework and this was about holding on to Steve's book and all these other kinds of things. It's like, I have done this. Now I'm really going off to do the work. And that was what I even too is when he had that conversation with Sam was after all of this time sitting in front of this wood like you know the woodland wallpaper with the birch trees in the background this was a fake forest common therapeutic and then here he was walking off into a true wooded area and you're like ah okay here was him going through the motions um and not really believing it and and it was in an he felt an artificial environment an artificial set of activities now he's had this conversation with sam and he's walking away into the woods to literally do the real work act oh that's i didn't pick up on that i did like that wallpaper but uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I that 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 makes so much sense because he's kind of got that fakeness behind him, and then he moves he moves forward uh, into the real the reality. That's great. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is, you look at the arc that people go through in a story like this, right? And you look at the way they grow. Um, you get a chance to see the roots of where Sam's character came from when it shows his sister and his family. One of the the bits that. Uh, early on everybody was talking about online that I saw was is Sam going to take the serum and here's how he could and here's how he yeah. should maybe or here's how he would or wouldn't or you know he's not or whatever and um those of you who listen to the show or to the to the podcast know uh, of of Daryl Daryl Mansell who runs the paprika uh pop culture group online and he was a big advocate of coming out and saying like um no he's not gonna and I tended to listen to Daryl because Daryl's not only is he big into to pop culture and nerddom and comics, but he's black and he's a veteran and he, and there's this like identification that I see, you know, of, of him is kind of channeling that that character. 
in a way of understanding more uh, in reality of that right of that part of being an American. And I was like, okay, we'll see Daryl. And I, he and I went back and forth a little bit about is he, isn't he? And I thought, you know, I hope he doesn't after having that conversation. Um, at first I'm thinking like, oh, you know, yeah, you should get it and get out there and punch a Thanos sized enemy someday. But then it's like, uh, no, actually part of his strength is that he wouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. He not only did he not, but he wouldn't given the chance. Well, and, and the fact that there was those different conversations so that he has the conversation and he meets Isaiah and, and there's, again, that, that part of it. And then at the same time, there's the conversation that Walker has with Lamar and where that goes. And so it is that definitely um, a different hero for a different time. And, and that was the other part that I liked in terms of, in addition to talking about the geopolitics, he was also talking about, you know, race relations and yeah. the, you know, the history. And so that's the other part when I think about, um, you know, how when we were talking talking in WandaVision, how there were actually, yes, it's about Wanda's grief, but it's also about Monica's grief. Well, this is about trauma for both of them and that Sam represents the intergenerational trauma of what it means to be Black in America, whereas Bucky's is about the individual trauma of manipulation, gaslighting, and being used as a weapon. And what's really interesting is that John Walker it, and, and they're all military folks. So there's there's all of this. So they're also encapsulating a military experience. And then as much as John Walker is positioned as the bad guy, he's really an anti-hero. And he represents somebody that, you know, when he sat there and he flipped out, he was Mr. I drank all the Kool-Aid. I did everything I was supposed to do. The blonde, blue-eyed guy that is da 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 And, you know, and, and this is, you don't understand. And it was basically a case of somebody not being frustrated by not recognizing where their positions of privilege and entitlement were coupled with the also not recognizing necessarily or, or not being able to reconcile how he drank the Kool-Aid and kind of painted himself into this own this corner where he's like suddenly going, oh, wait a minute. On some level, I did everything I was supposed to do. You made me this way. And so it was really interesting because we came across some online it was again, interesting conversations with the kids where there's like my son was like look at this there's a guy that's I like John Walker he's a guy that I can finally relate to ah oh you <laughs> like, saw that yeah yeah that that I saw a big thing of that on Twitter where people come out and say he's the real uh, hero of the story and it's like you dude you missed the point but yeah yeah it's like time... holy toxic masculinity dude <laughs> <laughs> and well and and the thing that I noticed and you know it's interesting because when he does that he rails against the the hearing or wherever where they yeah. they you know, de defrock him as Captain America, whatever in court, not court martial, but other than honorably discharge him. Yeah. Right? And it's like, you see that and it's like, dude, missed the point, you know, but at the same time, there is a point there to be, to be had, which is there's truth in what he's saying. And you get the tone that if there, and this ties really into today's world, if there hadn't been some cameras there, when what happened happened, would they have disciplined him at all or mm -hmm. as much, right? You know, they don't say that, but there is this element of him saying like, you put me out there, you put me in the situation, you did this, you did that. He's obviously projecting, right, his yeah. own sense of guilt, but at the same time, there's also a, a, a nugget of truth in there of like, well, you know, we are, there is some support over this over aggressive endemic toxicity and he was just a uh, fallen, like, it, it's easy to point to the guy who did this horrible thing and say, well, we, we disciplined him, we fixed it. And well, like, and, eh, and especially yeah. too, exactly. It's like, it's like, oh, I get where you're coming from, oh, but you kind of missed a key point, buddy. And one of it was the fact that I then when given this opportunity when he was sitting there in that conversation with Lamar, where he's already got the serum hasn't taken it in private yet, but he's asking him about it, but he's talking about how he sees this as the opportunity to redeem himself. Because Lamar's telling you, well, you've received, you know, these are all the, the actions, the awards, the citations that you've received. And he's like, yeah, but for what we did really for like the crappiest day of my life, something I wouldn't brag about, they gave me. So he's actually yeah. seeing the opportunity to be Captain America as an opportunity for redemption. But again, it comes that difference between like why are Steve and Sam one way and why is John another and it's this idea that Steve knows what it's like to be without power and and so it was about using it responsibly it's why he stepped 
and had that role where he was kind of the nomad, but they really didn't call him that again, the consequences yeah. of, of going rogue. Um, and, and, and just that idea of, I'm not going to be a weapon I'm of, of somebody else's use in the Sokovia Accords. And that Sam fits into that same thing. I know what it's like to be without power. And I think that's even where it comes down to with the whole mm -hmm. taking the serum was with, you know, if he'd had that opportunity, would he? Yeah. And it's, no, easy you to know say. what? I see what happens when people, you know, yeah. and again, and I'm, and, and, and my new best friend ever going to call each other that <laughs> has also had like the uber downside of it so you know what i'm really happy that like wakanda outfitted me in these fi this fine outfit but you know what i'm i'm just sam from louisiana and i'm gonna do my thing yeah and i want to i want to touch on that with sam but i was going to say about about walker one of the things that is easy to say and as a commentary I've even heard and seen people say is, well, you know, it was his best friend, his best friend, uh, you know, got killed and things. And it's like, well, okay, yes. And that's a plot point, obviously, and everything to push him over the edge. But, but a couple of things that are real interesting about that um, is that number one, he's supposed to be Captain America. He's supposed to be able to rise above that. Mm -hmm. The second is that he put himself in that by taking the serum before the tragedy <laughs> happened, he was already deciding, I'm going to like level up to really kick some ass and had already decided to embrace that aggression and violence as a, as a way of solving the problem. Right. And, this is and it. I think he was like a, a kick, you know, like kick, hurt, shoot, whatever, like act out first, think later. So that, that's the other part is that he Lamar into that. Like he, it, this is not that somebody else may have physically caused the harm that led to Lamar's death, but John's the one that kept pushing things and wouldn't wait and was impatient. So again, it's that whole, he had to flip the narrative and go to the family to seek validation that he sought, you know, yeah. justice for their friend or for their, you know, their family member, his best friend. And you're kind of like, dude, <laughs> you know, don't kick the hornet's nest. And then, you know, say that you're great hero for taking your friend to the ICU when he goes in, goes into anaphylaxis from the sting. Like you don't get, to, you don't get to be both yeah. the arsonist and the firefighter. You know? Absolutely. That's a good way to say it. You know, there's a, there's a, a, in, when you're working with trauma and when you're working with, uh, when people project blame, right. Uh, you can see, I've heard it called the blame and shame, the range mm -hmm. between the two, which is when you're not dealing with, with tragedy and you're not dealing with your emotions, in a healthy way and and toxic behavior toxic masculinity all of that really reinforces this that you bounce back and forth between either i'm guilty 100 percent, or i'm innocent 100 percent. and you could see that i could see you know in the in the part where walker runs from what happened he runs away from it literally before he's confronted right and then when he defends himself and so you can see him back back and forth here of like this was my fault no it wasn't it was everyone else's fault you know, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I let, I let Lamar down. No, I didn't. Everyone else did. Right. The, the, yeah. the world did this, this terrorist did the government did. And I see at the end of it, it's really interesting because I saw it as a tragic end within the series when he puts on the U S agent costume yeah. and he's, he does that little, I'm back baby. Woo. And it's like, he's retreating further into this identity of I'm innocent. Everyone mm -hmm. else is who set me up and I'm the hero. Right. Yeah. Well, and also in, again, based on that idea that he's clearly got some, again, it would be, you know, typical PTSD symptoms and, and, and even how he described like everything, like you made me his feelings about Afghanistan. Like he's, he's not okay with what he's done, yeah. but at least he was given this mantle, this op opportunity to redeem himself. And what's interesting is that when Val comes along, he just basically moved on from, frankly, from one manipulator to the other. If he feels like manipulated by his military service and um and you know being awarded for certain kinds of behavior and like you say whether it was caught on camera or not uh and then being you know awarded and then punished by the american government you know as for first becoming and then being you know dethroned or defrocked as captain america he he's just moved on to the next person that is treating him as a tool a weapon or whatnot and 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 again if anything, he represents that sort of the unhealed path of the three of them. This is 
person that is like you say staying in that little the ping pong yeah. between shame and blame and it's just going back and forth back and forth back and forth rationalizing justifying projecting acting out where other two have gone through the work and what was interesting was that i was expecting um I don't know how to describe it but in terms of what happened with bucky was actually a lot um happier more subtle more nuanced than what i was expecting and i the online stuff well why did it go from falcon and the winter soldier and how we're going to have you know there's a second season this captain america and the winter soldier but but what about bucky what about bucky why do they keep using this name and and it's like it's not fair he's gone through all this growth and then there's part of me going you know what i wouldn't be surprised if the second series ends with captain america and and the white and wolf probably another, another, right so yeah. yeah we'll see we'll see where it goes <laughs> we'll this see, was yeah. about getting the mantle onto sam and I mean, Bucky's got his own growth, but if somebody thinks, <laughs> somebody thinks he's going to get through all of this stuff with, you know, some time in Wakanda and six episodes on me. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, uh, therapy's great, but it's not a magic wand. And, and now it's like, uh, he's got a lot of stuff there where he, he's, he's literally <laughs> figuring out how to renegotiate the world. Like he didn't know how to do dating. He didn't know how to, you know, whether he his gloves off or not um finally playing with the family and and you know having kids hang off his arms or you know lying as on i the heard it somebody giving uh, those kids the eye called, and yeah just, yeah <laughs> and somebody called it he was already radiating mad stepdad energy with yeah. uh, the kids hanging from his <laughs> arm <laughs> checking out sam's sister yeah oh i, I mean that whole little like set that that was just was just hilarious <laughs> but again it was idea of watching him literally in some respects i mean we often talk about with trauma like the idea of age you have what what age the trauma happened at you kind of get frozen at and so here's this guy that on one level he's 106 and going well like what's wrong with you know playing was it pinochle or something like that <laughs> you know like <laughs> he's a old man and then at the same time it's the here's the guy that's literally frozen in his early 20s and hasn't had the chance to enjoy these things. And so he's kind of getting to be that guy in his twenties again and being uncle that shows up, you know, with the cake and horses around and does all of these things that literally been denied yeah. for 80 yeah. years. Yeah. And, and you look at that, there's also the feeling, I mean, here in this world also, right. He's like, as you put it, he's old, he's a world war two veteran. He's a superhero. He fought Thanos's army, you know? And, and so you could throw that in and say, when we are in a way, he's a stand in for, for anyone with that trauma for when we are experiencing like a setback emotionally developmentally and how there is also that embarrassment about it how do i network with people when i feel like i am behind them right mm -hmm. i feel othered by that experience and say oh i'm not quite getting it all together it's like air quote around the yeah. microphone um you know and then there's that shame that goes along with it too with uh that, one of the things that's very powerful uh when a powerful moment is the coolness of it uh, when Sam bursts through the window, he throws the shield. And one of the, I thought one of the most powerful delivery points emotionally for the series was when someone says to him, who are you? And he says, I'm Captain America. Just uh, as a side comment, walking past this guy. And the thing is, nobody told him to, that he could be. He just decided I am, right? And it ties in. Here's this culmination of all that he's talked about and they talk about his parents and they talk about his, his mom and his background in that community of knowing who he is. And at that moment saying like, I don't need anyone to tell me I can be Captain America, right? Yeah. I am, I know I am, right? Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was a very powerful moment and a good culmination of that character's security in who he is as a person. Exactly. And, and it reminds me of the conversation that happened just a little way, uh, I'm literally minutes before with Sarah about the boat, the whole like, you know, it for everything that has happened. And again, this going into cultural history of it, you know, how can I not like uh, all this blood yeah. is shed? If I was, you know, if I was in Isaiah's shoes, I would feel the exact same way but I'm not letting anybody stop me. And then the idea too, that he even, you know, starts, you know, talking to folks in front of the, you know, the cameras happen to be there and all of a sudden they're all on him. And it's the whole, like, I know people are going to be upset about this. Yeah. I know people are going to, you know, be, you know what, that's a them 
not a me problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then, exactly. And that Steve, Steve passed this shield on to me. I couldn't bear, I, I didn't feel I was worthy or couldn't bear the weight. And, and again, there was all of these things that I still needed to process. Went and gave it to the Smithsonian to hold on. And damn, if I'm going to trust you folks again with that. Because <laughs> right. look what you went and did. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you, you went and found the guy that had the really nice, you know, um, record on the... paper, but his raging ball of damage. <laughs> and you gave him a weapon. And then he goes and, and literally. But you know, he was white, himself up so and he runs around in a bad. roid rage. <laughs> well, no, and it was fitting. I read the first episode at the end when they give it to the, him to the blonde haired, blue eyed white soldier, right? And say, oh. and you could, and they lean on him a little when he's donating it, like, oh, you did the right thing, you did the right thing, you did the right thing. Yeah. We all feel more comfortable with John Walker. They didn't quite, and I thought, oh, wow, that's going to be a big, like, symbolical thing for the racism in America and the complicated mm -hmm. history and the trauma generationally. And then they just went for it. I mean, I was like, I thought, oh, that's, they're going <laughs> symbolic. And man, they went there. And I thought that was extremely powerful. And I, I thought it was, um, you mentioned it being, uh, him being sort of representative of not just his own development, but of general trauma. And I thought mm -hmm. they did a really good job of showcasing some of the different attitudes, like where is Isaiah at, right? And where, uh, you know, is his community at? And, you know, all the way down to the scene where uh, they're denied a loan. And you mm -hmm. know, and you're kind of, and it's like, you're an Avenger, and come on, you know, really, you guy, you can't help me out. And it's like, no, we just, our hands are tied. And how many people, particularly people of color in this nation, I know you're, we're, this is an international audience out there and you're actually in Canada. So yeah, well, and, know, and again, you guys don't Canada have Canada likes problems. to pat itself on the back for stuff, but for us, it's the God, if you're an indigenous person in this country, yeah, we still, we are still rife with our own is yeah. where it's exactly that that you know two different people with the exact same qualifications could walk in but if the skin tone or the name gives any kind of a ethnic flag boom totally different results and there was that line one of the lines it ties also in with that alternate choice and that's what sam and bucky represent against john walker in a way is the alternate choice to be healthy but there's that line where Bucky acknowledges to him and says, you know, Steve and I both didn't really think about what it meant to ask a black man to be Captain America. And I'm sorry that I that we did that. I'm sorry that I didn't take that into account. So the apology part, very healthy, right? But that yeah. acknowledgement to say, well, there's a whole bunch going on here that Sam, you get it and you know, and you are working through it that boy, I was, I was, you know, ignorant and uh, uh, insensitive to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, well, and, it, and it's interesting that because that's something that a lot of folks, it, it, again, when we get into the issues around the complicated history of North America, and I mean, what I used to do before I was get into office was I was actually teaching, and I was a non-Indigenous academic teaching in, mostly in Indigenous studies, and so I, you know, my mentors were everything from university professors to, you know, Indigenous elders. It was a thing. I remember the first class that I had to teach here in Manitoba after getting my PhD. I had to walk into a class of 36 Indigenous social workers, and they had been practicing without, they'd been basically grandparented into some, so there's a memorandum of understanding. So they were going to do their BSWs while still practicing. So I had to walk into this room as they were working, a lot of them worked for child and family services. And it was like, okay, so we're going to talk about the fact intro to indigenous studies course is being taught to 36 indigenous <laughs> social workers by a white from the burps by the only person in the room who is not yeah, from that background yeah, exactly <laughs> and, and so it was like the i don't expect you to trust me like me this and that but what i will tell you is as the the, the one privileges of the lily white skin that i've got here and the ancestry of my family that i've been given us to certain information and positions of power that you have been systemically denied consider me your secret decoder ring and, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to dump a whole bunch of stuff on you. You're going to talk about how complicated this is. And I've got as much or more to learn from you as, you know, I'm supposedly teaching you kind of thing. I'm, I, you know, and you had those complicated things, but it puts you in some really, you know, like it's, it's one of those things. It's like, if we're going to have growth, you, you learn from uncomfortable positions. And so to have 
Bucky do that was kind of that again here 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 they'd been you know again one guy was a little bit more screwed up than the other thanks to how he how he'd been treated with super serum but the point was is that you hear two white guys going sure sam's a great guy let's pass it on to him what could the problem uh, <laughs> and then it took all of this for bucky to go yeah so seemed like a good idea at the time got ticked at you it was all about me i made it all about me and my feelings about steve and what the end you know, the shield and my family and oops it wasn't all about me <laughs> absolutely one of the and, things no you, you go first <laughs> no no no. i'm just saying and that that that's something that i think a lot of us as as folks that are descended of settlers kind of you know take a take a lesson from Bucky on that if you haven't walked in those shoes you don't often know what what what's going on in somebody's head and why they're getting to that place and why they feel a challenge because you've never been in that place yeah. and so it's not that you're ignorant this that or you just don't have the experience and so if somebody tells you a thing is tough because sometimes you just okay take your word and, for it you've lived and, it not me and hey you know if guys who were born in the 20s can get it um, <laughs> can sit in a support group with a gay man and, and, and listen to his experience or, you know, learn race relations and Hey, you know, the rest of us ought to get with it. Um, <laughs> exactly. I decided to, yeah, I know they're not real people. Um, I think I know that. Um, but the thing what is, mean, Bucky's yeah. not real. Hold on. My whole reality. Poof. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit that part out. Don't worry. Never happened. Never happened. Um, one of the things that struck me too is the nature of heroism, right? Because we focus on the, the, this is a universe where, you know, you might, if you're an Avenger, you might be firing a pistol standing next to a God who's wielding lightning. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a very fascinating dynamic to try to, to sort out and to have the hero of this story uh, be a person. And then when, one of the things that really struck me, was the scene where um, they're talking about, well, mom used to feed the neighborhood and you're still doing that. And you look mm -hmm. and it's like, well, he actually comes from a family of heroes, right? He comes yeah. from that tradition. And then he picks up the phone and from a movie perspective, it, it had a certain power to it when uh, you can hear the little voiceovers and he's calling around. Number one, once again, healthy, a healthy person, a healthy man, he's reaching out and asking for help. for help, right? And saying, we need to ask for help. And when he is doing that, you hear uh, some voices, somebody just saying like, all oh, the Wilsons need help, I'll be there. You know, that's all we need to know. And it reminded me of the scene, uh, the, the, at the end of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, right? Where there's actually a line where it said, all that anybody just needed to know is George is in trouble and we're here. And it's the kind of community, you know, it made me start crying when I watched it because it's the kind of sense of community and connection that we all would like to have right mm -hmm. and that comes from a certain type of heroism a certain type of connectivity well and this even goes back to the dynamic with with Carly because Carly is much like um again it, much like John Walker in the sense that here are these people that you know so she's trying to build community um but she's seeing how that serum can them you know it, it, it's one of those things that in if authority figures and powers above us have done this then what we need to do is flip the power back on them as a, you know we're going to dismantle the system by blowing the system up and one of the the biggest the, the heroism in terms of how sam you know tried to and again it would get by John at different points whether it was him breaking into the room he just wanted to talk with her because as another person who had never had power, despite the fact that, yeah, the, yeah, he had the wings, he had this, she's got this idea of who he is. He gets her more than she realizes or will give him credit for because of what side he's theoretically on, even though he is, you know, frankly, a rogue free agent in many respects, um, that, you know, he sat there and tried to reach out to her. And, um, and again, different things would come into the crossfire that and then when she you know sees him again and, and but this time now he's captain america he's like oh you see I, I didn't think you know there you are you, you're exactly what i expected you fell for it you drank the coup and he's like no i'm trying something different and then he wouldn't fight her and so that he just sat there and he just dodged her and it's like nope not gonna fight you not gonna fight you not gonna fight you and and then ended up you know carrying her out when she's yeah. shot 
and then saying that, this young girl died because and, and looking like an angel by the way they have called her those names and did those yeah. things and 2.0 is going to be scarier it's a great point i remember soon after how soon after i don't remember it was a long time ago but it wasn't that long it was maybe within a year or two after 9 11 that i went to this presentation at a just at a college and they had a political discussion whatever that was going on and there was a guy there who'd written some books about suicide bombers and he's arab american and i i, probably, I don't know his name because it's uh, uh i'd have to actually do research and <laughs> the only research i did was on falcon and the winter soldier <laughs> oh gosh didn't expect to bring it up but anyway He'd written a couple books on this subject and was talking about how if we don't understand why a person would commit that act we're never gonna do any good in trying to combat the problem right and he made a big deal of combating the problem that what are the circumstances under which this type of uh, fanaticism or this type of fear or this type of hatred or whatever it is what are the circumstances under which it blooms and i remember that the sentiment around it that soon after that there was still this kind of like tra this this tragic sense of loss and this whole thing that had turned into this kind of ethnocentrism um, mm -hmm. that uh, we tend to remember we tend to i think we tend to romanticize the idea we all came together so well i mean some of us more yeah. than others came together against others who who were different right but anyway i just remembered that um and you look at that and that's essentially what he's saying, which is, you know, you're going to label her a terrorist and we're going to say, just like, I mean, in a way, like with Walker, he's fired, problem solved. Terrorist is dead, problem solved. Hey, new <laughs> Captain America, and he's black, problem solved. There's no oh. more racism. You could just hear, you could hear the dude bros who exist in the MCU, right? Just, just blogging about racism's gone now. We had a black yeah. Captain America. So, um, and, and what he's advocating is actually difficult. It's hard work to actually get to the root of something and try to change it, right? Well, and this is exactly it. Like what, what causes somebody to become radicalized? And it is trauma, othering, and, and marginalization, and lack of empathy, lack of supports, and, and all of these different things. And he reminds them like, you know, you can do this with a phone, you can do that with an email. And so I think the other part too, was the idea of political will. And somebody that's been in elected office, I get that there's the competing things, but I can tell you the like one of the most frustrating things that I've ever dealt with has honest been you, sometimes there's there's less frustration from the folks that stand ideologically opposite to you. And sometimes the, there's more frustration with folks that are closer to you, but they're always worried about, well, how's this gonna look? What's this gonna do? We, do da 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 da, da, da and, and all of these things about oh the, the money and the cost and and as, and especially when it comes to this kind of stuff because it always gets pitted as well why should we be sending foreign aid somewhere well when we can't look after people in our own backyard and it's like oh it's an infrastructure thing it's about investing in people it's about doing these different kinds of things and that it's you know sometimes you got to do stuff that it's planting the tree knowing that you're not going to get the chance to sit beneath it or eat the apple and that you might even be planting a tree somewhere else or that it's about diffusing a larger situation and i mean i remember explaining to folks because i came from a social democratic party and explaining why we were investing in you know because i represented a relatively new neighborhood and so trying to explain to them why investments were being made in the inner city in the core in, in people that they had written off and it was trying to explain, well, you keep telling me that you've got this problem over here and you think it's caused by those people that I just about making an investment in. Well, do you realize that by my making an investment, I am technically solving that problem because of that kid, you know, you're alleging that that kid from that neighborhood is some sort of gangbanger and he's going to go do this and that. Well, if I help him finish high school, go to university and whatever the heck he wants to be when he grows up, well, guess what? He ain't going to be tagging your garage. <laughs> no, no, you know, you had to kind of gloss over the fact dude is not coming all the way out to this neighborhood to tag your garage. So if you if you're worried about your garage being tagged, I would go to the, you know, the eight kids from your neighborhood right. that were hanging out by the sev and one of 
be your son or your best friend's son, but you just, you didn't go down that path. It was the, what's, what was their problem? And I think this was that kind of both microcosm and macrocosm is that they're all global citizens. And that's even where their whole notion of like, you know, uh, he was leading a group of people that didn't want international borders because they saw what the divisions were doing to people and that people were acting like rights were pie and you know there's only so many slices and so if, if you get a slice of pie it's like no no it's not pie. it's not pie um and so and again in some respects they weren't wrong and you even watched how the flag smashers some of them changed as she got more and more radicalized and, and we're kind of doing that, oh, wait a second, you just blew up a building. Or you just, oh, well, you know, if we have to, they're supposed to be hostages. Yeah, but if we have to kill them, that's the only message. And you're just watching these guys right to the point of where she gives it the whole, you know, um, because one, one people, one world and the, the first line. And then it's like, and crickets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and you know, it, it goes back to the thing there's a couple little pitfalls people fall into. I hear people say, well, you know, take, take Thanos, like with Endgame mm -hmm. and all that, you know, Thanos could have used the power to just double the resources instead of half the people. Right. And on the other hand, then you say people who watch this kind of post blip world on the movies and the shows and say, well, Than look, there's, they're saying Thanos was right. And the problem is, is that once again, I think it circles back to the idea uh, that it's easy to kill half, I mean, it's not really easy to kill half the people in the universe, but anyway, it's, it's easy for the all powerful being to say, well, I'll do that. Cause if you double the resources, you still have to teach people to get along, right? You mm -hmm. still have to change the culture. You still have to, uh, uh, you know, and it's like, oh, uh, was Thanos correct? Look at all the resources that are now scarce again, now that everyone's back. And it's like, no, look at all the, the, the fear and selfishness that is back. Right. Yeah. And, and it's like trying to actually change it in a way that is healthy, once again, hard. And we don't like to do things that are hard, right? Oh, no, it's it's, it's always about the quick fix. And that's the whole other thing, too. It's like 50% of the population might have been gone, but were there equitable? So technically, there were more resources for half, you know, the same amount of resources for half as many people. Were they equitably distributed? Did right. the world become yeah, you get this non-hierarchical collective democracy? You don't, in that you time? don't get the idea. Yeah, you don't get the idea that the people sitting on that committee were saying, hey, how many of our families are going to be affected by this? Or, you know what I mean? There still is the tone that those in power and those with money are probably a lot better off with the post blip because they're able to just be happy. Hey, my, my loved one's back. All right, cool. Move back into my plenty of room house and plenty of f available food and uh, not thinking about it. So it really is a good, yeah, it really is a good analogy for a lot of the things that, uh, that are real. All right. Well, and that was the other thing too, that Sam mentioned, he says, when you're making these decisions, who's in the room with you? Are, is it more people like you or is it? And that was one of the things as an elected official that we have to get more normal people, normal in, in, in office. We have, Get more, we have to take, and again, it doesn't matter what country you're in, there's different degrees of whatever, but we have to separate money, power, and privilege from democracy and elected officials. I remember meeting a, a woman, I was part of the Midwestern Legislative Conference, and met a newly elected uh, House representative uh, from Wisconsin. And she was telling me how she was the first teacher elected into representation in a decade. I'm like, who, how are you making up education policy? If there's been no teachers. Been no teachers. <laughs> Meanwhile, I sat there and I was part of a caucus and a government where it was like, oh, good Lord. Like if you took the teachers out of the equation, like our entire team was based on teachers and social workers yeah. and history professors. And, you know, I, like it was one of those things and nurses and, and, you know, like, it was it was it was uh, this cross section of people. I mean, we used to joke that we let a couple of lawyers in because you know, <laughs> rather, you know, yeah, somebody's got to keep you legal and so uh, don't, don't break the law. That, right. you know, but I mean, one of them was a constitutional slash environmental lawyer who used you know. So there, but another one was family law. So it was it was this kind of thing where we have to get real people in office because part of the cynicism that we even have around politics right now is that. Now, only certain people really get to live the fantasy of, you know, you know, you guys have got that American dream. Anybody can grow up to be the president of the United States. Well, can they really, right. you know, and, yeah. and so 
we've got a system in Canada here where I wouldn't say it's, it's as extreme because of the, the different things we have in terms of election laws, but it's still so often a silver spoon old boys club where you've got folks looking after who they are. I mean, I remember sitting around decision making tables and going, that's a, I, I get what you guys are trying to do with that solution, but okay, everybody in the room that's been a single mom on social assistance who you claim that you're trying to help, everybody here put up your hand. Oh, oh, look at only hand in the room here. So can I tell you why this thing <laughs> isn't going to work the way you think it is? Because you've, you know, and, and it was the same thing with, with again, in term, from a mental health perspective, was that same thing about bringing the lived experience and going public with my mental health while responsible for a $6 billion budget was because I wanted people to know that I didn't claim to be perfect. I wasn't going to have all the answers. You know, there's no magic wand hidden under a cushion on the sofa that I'm going to be able to wave and like set, fix the entire mental health system of the province, but I'm going to do my bloody best. I know what it's like to have walked in these places and more of us who have lived in the, the shitty real estate, whether it's socioeconomic, mental health, you name it, more of us need to be in a decision-making tables, whether it's at, as elected officials, whether it's as policy analysts. And so I kind of like the fact that Sam called folks on that too. Like there was yeah. a part of me as a, as a former government minister going, yes, <laughs> yeah, damn it. That's exactly. it. Thank you, Sam. If I was teaching or if I was still in office, I would be pulling out this speech and, I, you know, either my students or my colleagues would be like sick of me playing this video clip. <laughs> Well, this is always, always a pleasure to be able to get together with you. And I could, we could keep going about different Marvel things. Yeah. Like in fact, we probably will again, some point soon be talking about it. Why don't you uh, let everybody know, because I know we just recorded about WandaVision, but that one might come out if they don't come out next to each other or one of them's on the, might be on the Patreon or whatever. Tell everyone where to find you and, and yeah. what you do. Well, um, besides being like an Uber Marvel nerd, <laughs> I, I do That's work in mental health. My Come company on. is called Speak Up, um, Speak Up Mental Health Advocates, and I can be found at www.speak-up.co, C-O. And um, I work in mental health education, advocacy, and training. And so, in fact, one of the projects that I'm really sort of knee-deep in right now is I've been working with a a lot of pediatricians to help them work with the young folks that have that they that have mental health and neurodiversity diagnoses and help them reframe how they see themselves so that they can see themselves as superheroes. So I use um, characters from the MCU as metaphors, and I I train pediatricians, doctors, and other mental health professionals to basically be somebody's Professor Hulk or somebody's Professor X. And I give them the language of, and the stories of nerddom so that they can connect with you so that you feel empowered about the diagnoses you live with rather than stigmatized and othered. It's, so it's very powerful stuff. It's something that if you go back in the archives of this show, you can, uh, the first time that we talked, we talked a lot about that, reframing uh, symptoms of superpowers. And as I've told you before, I use it a lot now whenever mm -hmm. I talk to people too. And um, only cite you some of the time. I should work on that part, right? I should say, wait, <laughs> I'll give out your website when I do. No, but it's it's a very powerful and meaningful reframe for people. So well, Sharon, th yeah. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for letting oh, me yeah. um, share the, this wacky perspective. Like I said, I know that not everybody gets it, but um, again, long before I was formally in, in any, you know, be able to seek out mental health supports. I can tell you that Stanley, Jack Kirby and the Marvel universe were some of my first therapists. Yeah. So they gave me people that I could connect to. And it's wonderful now to be able to see those characters of all and talk to you about that. Hope that sharing these stories helps other people have an aha moment and seek help, do the work and live their lives as superheroes. <laughs>